Well, we're now in the late 1800s and inter-imperial competition has heated up. The Boer War in South Africa reveals how weak the British Empire has become at defending itself. Hundreds of thousands of troops from Australia and other imperial domains are required to put down an insurrection in South Africa. And on top of that, it's widely reported that 60% of English volunteers have been refused military duty <coughs> due to physical weakness and health problems. In fact, many of the political class begin to identify in the weaknesses of the English working stock the fatal weaknesses of the imperial Anglo-Saxon family. So what of those unincorporated English poor? The emergence of a specifically urban poor is very much commented upon from the 1850s onwards. Here are some descriptions of well-to-do travellers visiting poor urban neighbourhoods mainly the East End, it seems as if we were in a new land and among another race, a caste apart, a race of whom we know nothing, whose lives are of quite different complexion from ours. Sir George Nichols, a poor law commissioner appointed in the 1834 Poor Law Act, gives this new race a name, the residual, the left behind. Heard of that one recently? Who remain in a condition of primitive poverty, ignorance and subjection. The residuum are especially prominent in the East End and its port areas, the places that connect the savage coloni colonies to the civilised heartland. In fact, the East End is regularly described in the late 19th century as wilds, dens, the dark continent populated by wild races, wandering tribes. Still, by the time of the Boer War, the slave analogy has been replaced with the so-called science of race. Eugenics is its name, it was in the papers the other day. Eugenicists are concerned with the degeneration of a population's biological stock and they want to find ways to intervene against such degeneration. And it's through eugenics that the problem of the residual, the English poor, increasingly is dealt with. And I'm going to claim that the British welfare state arises out of eugenics. Let's take William Beveridge, the well-known author of the report in 1942 which scoped out universal health care, unemployment benefit, national insurance and social services. At the turn of the 20th century, a young Beveridge argues that it's the dysgenic effects of the less civilised urban industries that produces a degenerate posterity. At the same time, Beveridge worries that if skilled labourers, the best of the lose their jobs and would have to fall back upon casual work, work that breeds undeserving attributes, then this too will degenerate the, uh, the English stock. He even advocates permanent and compulsory colonies for the undeserving unemployed. Now, Beveridge is a eugenicist. And he's still one when he writes his famous report on welfare in 1942. In fact, in 1943, he gives that annual lecture to the Eugenic Society. Not secretly either, as it was done the other day. This at a time when Hitler has embarked upon the final solution, the so-called Jewish problem. In his lecture, Beveridge argues for a universal children's allowance. Child benefit, basically. This, he says, is necessary to support the skilled wage earners, who represent probably the largest stock of heritable ability in the country and a store which it is vital to keep as large as possible. But the problem for Beveridge is that this group tends to have less and less children. Financial support from the state, he believes, would encourage them to reproduce. So, good stock is deserving. And as skilled and settled working men, good stock has been enfranchised into the Anglo-Saxon family. Good stock is orderly in its independence. It's deserving of better insurance, health, social services, to ensure it remains that way. Bad stock is undeserving. And as the residuum has not been enfranchised into the family, this stock needs to be treated with preventative measures, measures that will at the very least quarantine it <coughs> from the good stock. These are the principles that will underlie much of the legislation that births the welfare state, so-called, in 1948. So what I'm saying is that universal welfare comes together 
out of eugenicist enterprise to protect the Anglo-Saxon stock that lies at the heart of the British Empire.